on trauma, which is a very broad topic. I mean, anything can be trauma. So I've uh, narrowed it down to primarily anterior segment trauma. We'll go over things, uh, blunt trauma, penetrating, perforating trauma. That's going to be the bulk of our discussion. That's pretty much the ruptured globe talk. Chemical injuries we'll spend some time on. And then I have a couple uh, special situations that I, I'll show you. And at any point during the discussion, if you guys have any questions, just scream. You don't have to raise your hand. Just stop me, and uh, we'll slow down. Generally speaking, there's about 2.5 million eye injuries per year. Most of these injuries happen in young men. And most of these injuries, eye injuries, are in people not wearing protective eyewear. And that faded picture you've got there in the background is a great picture of Ralph Macchio getting kicked in the stones. And I bet you here he wished he had some kind of protection. If you want to view more, you have to go to the Karate Kid website. So when you're in the emergency room and you get the phone call from somebody and they say, you know, I think I have somebody here who, who maybe has an eye trauma, maybe a ruptured globe, uh, you know, what do you want to know? Well, you want to know what the nature of the injury was. Did he get hit with a paintball? Was it a bungee cord? Did he get hit with a stick? Was it just a tennis ball to the eye? Are there any other associated injuries? Probably the worst thing that can happen, this has happened you know, in other emergency rooms and probably in ours, is somebody calls you and they have an eye injury and their primary goal is to get that patient out of their emergency room into somebody else's. So you end up with a patient who may or may not have a ruptured globe in our emergency room and they have a pneumothorax or some other issue that we are not really equipped to handle. So you want to make sure if they have other associated injuries, they stay where they are until they're stabilized. What's already been done? Have they started antibiotics? Have they had a, you know, any injections? What else is going on? Make sure you know what treatment's been started. Have they been irrigated if it's a chemical injury? And what are we going to have to do when they get here? Of course, once you start talking to the third years or the attendings, probably the first question that's going to come out of our mouth is, well, when they eat last. And the reason is we want to know how quickly it is that you know, we can get them into the operating room if necessary. One of the more common causes of an intraocular foreign body, and we'll talk about these later, is metal-on-metal -metal injuries. You know, was there a projectile involved? Could there be an intraocular foreign body, and have they been scanned or imaged? Do we know what's going on? And one of the most important things, and I, I learned this the hard way, is what was the condition of the eye before the injury? Was this somebody who was minding their own business and two guys jumped them? Or is this somebody who had you know, eight different corneal transplants, they slipped on the ice, hit their eye on the... Uh, mailbox, and now they have a dehisc graft. That eye was hand motion before. What are we going to expect afterwards? I learned this the hard way by, um, and this is where documentation becomes very important. We, were, uh, we had a call for a, a traumatic injury, and in the emergency room, they had the vision checked as 2100 uh, in the injured eye. And, you know, as a uh, actually as a third year resident, going into the operating room, I was seeing the patient prior to the uh, to the surgery, but didn't pay that much attention to what was going on as far as the vision. The exam, I looked at very closely, but didn't really look at what they had checked the vision at. And this was one of those ruptured globes where there was pretty much no chance this patient was seeing 2100, and probably not much of a chance they were going to see 2100 after the surgery either. Uh, luckily, just before we went in, I looked at the eye, happened to look at the vision. The two didn't go together and rechecked the vision. It was actually light perception. He ended up staying light perception postoperatively for a couple months and then went on to NLP. The reason I bring that up is, <clears throat> you know, a ruptured globe is a ruptured globe. You know, if we see somebody with a small nail injury, we say, oh, they had a, you know, a small ruptured globe. Somebody gets hit by a uh, paintball point blank rage and their eye basically explodes, it's still a ruptured globe. And you want to make sure that people know how severe their injury was so when they go back and they have their kind of destroyed egg rupture globe and it gets repaired and the vision's poor, they don't talk to their neighbor who says, oh, I had a rupture globe and I'm 20-20. They look back and say, why? You want to make sure that you have your visions documented accurately so you can not only, <clears throat> you know, document what was done, but so you can counsel your patients as to what to expect postoperatively. Somebody with a small cornea laceration, no other problems, just need a stitch, probably going to see pretty well in five or ten years. Somebody with a 25 millimeter corneal scleral laceration and uveal prolapse, that might be a different discussion. What kind of a workup do you initiate for these people? And you want to do as much as you possibly can, uh, as much medical workup as you can, the best uh, slit lamp exam as you can. And you know it's not always possible to get these people to a slit lamp, but if you can, you should do it. 
You want to know as much prior to surgery as you can. A normal intraocular pressure, okay, if you can get an IOP, and sometimes it's not a good idea to even attempt, does not rule out a ruptured globe. You can have an open globe and a normal pressure. Then what do you do as far as imaging? Do we get x-rays, CAT scan? Can you do a, a, a B scan or an MRI? We'll get to the imaging studies later on. But the point of the fact is do as much slit lamp exam as possible. If you can do an exam on the retina, do it. There's no better way to find an intraocular foreign body than see it. I mean, I think one of the prognostic things also is to check the pupils because an APD is a bad sign. You can get that from looking at the good eye. Right. Right, so it, the, just because someone has trauma uh, does not mean you forget what you've learned all throughout residency. As much exam as you can, and checking the pupils can tell you an awful lot about the prognosis of the other eye. I agree. What's this? Pyrel. Yeah, positive side L test. You have a little laceration. You're not sure if it's, uh, if it's full thickness. You take a fluorescein strip, you put a bunch of uh, opthetic on it or, or saline, you paint that area, and you'll see kind of this river of green through, the, uh, through that dark orange fluorescein. What are some other telltale signs of trauma? I guess I'll tell you here. All right. This is not a great example, but we've got our almost 360 degrees of subconch hemorrhage. Now, this one is nice and flat, but if you saw a big, you know, chemotic hemorrhage, uh, reduced vision, you couldn't see into the eye to be confident that it wasn't uh, a ruptured globe, that might be somebody who needs exploration. Iris damage. Okay, here we have a, a couple areas of iridodialysis. In this case, it was not a, a ruptured globe. But the classic pointed pupil, like you see here, the pupil will usually point to the area of damage because it's, it's stuck or incarcerated in the corneal laceration. This one also, and it's hard to see, has an intraocular cilia. If something is inside the eye that belongs outside the eye, there's probably a hole somewhere where it went through. This one's got two things. We have irregular pupil. Pupil's coming out through the cornea, and we have a hyphema. Hyphema alone doesn't mean the patient has an open globe, but it's certainly a risk factor, and it shows that the trauma was significant. External injury. And if you were to raise this lady's eyelid, what you'd see is a obviously lacerated globe. Intraocular foreign bodies. Once again, if there's something that belongs outside, inside the eye, it got in there somehow, and somewhere there's a full thickness laceration or hole. So I've divided this up into a couple different sections. We've got our blunt trauma, which we'll start talking about now, the penetrating trauma, chemical injuries, special situations, here we go with blunt trauma. Well, what is it? I happen to catch this on video. Very rare. The guy's out playing tennis, gets hit in the eye by the ball, and now he's in our emergency room. You know, it's hard to get that. I got that on, caught on video three. So this is non-penetrating injuries, okay? There's, there's not necessarily a hole in the eye, okay? But it can still cause extensive damage. High femas vitreous hemorrhages, damage to the iris, uh, angle recession, damage to the lens, traumatic cataracts, dislocated lenses, dislocated IOLs, all kinds of stuff. Just because it didn't make a hole doesn't mean it's not bad. Posterior segment trauma is included here, and I'm not going to talk about much of this, but um, you know, traumatic macular holes, uh, choroidal ruptures, uh, scleropteria, the high velocity injuries. One of the more severe iridodialyses that we've seen What's this? Angle recession. Can you see it here? Right where the angle dips in. A very pretty uh, traumatic cataract. Sometimes they're not so pretty. They can be severe and sometimes need urgent or emergent surgery. This is a conjunctival foreign bodies from a blast injury. I, I kind of put this slide in here because it's somewhere in between penetrating trauma and uh, blunt trauma. This patient also had several foreign bodies on the, on the cornea as well. Each of these injuries is treated differently. Most of it is supportive. If someone's got a bad hyphema, you would probably cycloplegia, maybe put them on steroids and don't move for a couple days. Foreign bodies, you would take out the slit lamp, vitreous hemorrhages, you just keep your fingers crossed and hope that it goes away. No. 
<clears throat> it, it, the subconjunctival foreign bodies, even corneal foreign bodies, you try and get them out, uh, especially if they're in the visual axis. But as long as the eye's quiet, they don't all have to come out. It's just each case is, is different. And if the foreign bodies are easy to remove, they should be taken out. If they're difficult, uh, you can leave them if they're not causing associated damage or inflammation. That's all I'm going to say about blunt trauma. We're going to spend the bulk of our time here on penetrating and perforating trauma, which is our ruptured globes. I got another video. This just goes to show when you're mowing the lawn, you should have your protective eyewear on because you never know when you're going to hit a rock. And if you hit a rock, I guarantee you it's going to hit you in the eye. And then you're going to have to come to Will's in that special Will's ambulance. It has the emblem on it. That took me 45 minutes, uh, 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, so penetrating perforating trauma is trauma that causes an actual break in the eye wall. This is our ruptured globe. And like I mentioned before, the prognosis is going to depend on the mechanism of injury and where that laceration is. When you look in the book, if it's assuming it's kind of a blunt trauma causing the laceration, the most likely sites of the perforation are at the limbus, just posterior to the, to the intraocular muscles, uh, sorry, extraocular muscles, and at a cervical wound. I can almost guarantee you if someone had an extra cap 10 years ago or they've had a penetrating keratoplasty, that cervical wound is what's going to open up first. They are never as strong as the eye wall once was.